Good evening, fellow Earthlings. Welcome to the uh, March meeting of the Naperville Astronomical Association. You're from uh, lovely Northern Illinois. I am Drew Carhart, the Grand Club President. And uh, as always, I'd like to just thank you for joining us. I'll start out with uh, just some brief announcements on our uh, upcoming events. We have uh, on the schedule uh, in two weeks from now, our astronomy fundamentals presentation on uh, Tuesday the 16th. And uh, we're going to be tackling a very basic look at a very popular topic of astrophotography. Um, that word, which means taking pictures of the sky actually encompasses a huge number of different techniques and different sorts of equipment that you can use, ranging from the simplest to the most complex and cheapest to most expensive. And this presentation is mainly going to try to sort that out and let you know kind of what you're talking about when you say astrophotography and uh, wondering whether or not you can get into it. Uh, so again, a basic overview of the whole universe of astrophotography. A month from now, at our April monthly meeting, we're going to have an interesting um, panel presentation, uh, a group of staff and students from Wheaton College up the road from us here. And they're going to be talking about a project they've been working on, on simulating a Mars settlement and all the intricacies of what it would take to uh, put people on Mars and have them be able to stay there. So uh, that'll be our program for Tuesday, uh, April 6th. Of course, both of those presentations are where you hear, are here now um, online. And uh, for our general calendar, which again, mainly has our <laughs> scheduled programs on it now and not a lot of observing things yet, uh, check our website and neighbor, at neighboraster.org and, and uh, the calendar has more details. If you uh, follow us on Facebook, or you're a member and follow the club message board, you'll get notifications of any pop-up uh, spur of the moment events we do, observing oriented events, which we're certainly hoping to get back into now that the weather is uh, warming up, the snow is melting off. So uh, look for that. Also, uh, do want to reiterate uh, that we welcome everyone to tune into our YouTube channel, um, whether you're a YouTube fan or not. We have over 30 presentations now that we've done over the last year of uh, monthly meeting programs and our fundamentals presentations and observing session uh, streams that have been edited and are up there now. So if you missed something, if you uh, want to review something that uh, you thought was uh, educational or uh, you want to share our, any of our videos with other people, there they are on YouTube waiting for you. And uh, as always, and perhaps Someone, some of you are watching this sometime in the future uh, on YouTube as a recorded set. Um, do please uh, share or, or subscribe and uh, um, tell other people about our channel so uh, our great works get passed along more. For tonight's uh, presentation, as per usual, if you're watching us live here now, uh, you can ask questions of our speaker and uh, the same normal methods that we're always using now if you're watching us on Facebook put a uh, question you have any questions you have in the comments column and Jim in our control room will pass those along to the speaker if you are not on Facebook or you just prefer to use uh, email you can send us an email too and uh, he's also watching the inbox for that address and we'll pull any questions that come in in real time out of there and pass those along also to the speaker. So um, without further ado, this evening we have a uh, guest speaker, uh, sort of a guest speaker. <laughs> Donna's also been a member of our club, so uh, she's a little bit of each. Uh, Donna works uh, at the Fermi lab up the road from us here. Um, the, the Fermi National Accelerator Laboratory, more properly. And she's going to be speaking to us this evening about one of the uh, facilities that they actually have developed there uh, and has been playing an important part all across physics, actually. Uh, so without further ado, I am going to turn the screen over to Donna and uh, 
if I can do the right things. And <laughs> and uh, let her take Great. the airwaves. Here Great. you go. Uh, thank you very much for having me. And I'm looking forward to giving you a virtual tour of the lab that I work at at Fermilab called SIDA, the Silicon Detector Facility. I'm going to share my screen and we'll get started on the tour. Welcome to SIDET, Fermilab's Silicon Detector Facility. I will pause a few times during the talk for questions, um, but it's also okay if you interrupt me. And of course, we can have questions at the end. So here's a map of Fermilab. For scale, instead of using a linear scale, I like to use the four mile circumference of the large Tevatron accelerator ring. Cited is located about a mile away from the four mile accelerator ring. And on the site of Fermilab are many, many buildings and laboratories for doing all kinds of physics and astrophysics today. Um, but you'll notice there's also a lot of blue and green on this map. And that, that's because Fermilab has a large number of, a large area of natural areas. So there are a lot of lakes and, and other natural areas. In fact, a total of 291 bird species have been recorded at Fermilab. I'm involved in bird monitoring at Fermilab and I just chose a couple of my, not my favorites, I don't have any favorites because I love them all, but I included a picture of, of a crane, of a, of a of, a, of the sandhill cranes, a, a song sparrow, a chestnut-sided warbler, a piping plover, an eastern meadowlark, and a mute swan. So as you can see from the season shown in the pictures, there are birds on site all year round. So again, sighted is located about a mile down from the ring. And, oops, sorry. And here in this picture, which is an aerial view, a real view where you really see the blue and the green, this is the four mile Tevatron ring. And here is, here is SIDET. In the early days of Fermilab, this ring here accelerated protons. They hit a target about here underground and produced many, many particles. Um, the mesons were selected and we bent via a magnetic spectrometer over to the meson detector area. The protons were bent to the right to the proton detector area. And the particles, the neutral particles, especially the neutrinos, which you couldn't control their direction because they're neutrally charged, or they're not charged, they're neutral, went straight ahead to where SIDET now is. So that requires a little bit of explanation. Um, usually we think of Fermilab as this colliding detector, but in the first days of operation, they accelerated only protons, hit the target, as I mentioned, and produced all these particles. And physicists put targets at the end of these fixed target beam lines. So in those days, SIDET didn't exist as SIDET, it existed as the bubble chamber area. So this is a picture of SIDA today, and here's the bubble chamber that used to be underground here when the neutrinos came underground from this direction to interact in the bubble chamber to study neutrino physics. Um, I'll say a little bit more about the bubble chamber in a few slides from now, but while we're looking at SIDA, I'll show you the other parts of SIDA. So on the right, we have two giant clean rooms. Uh, under this large dome, which we call the geodesic dome, is a large 20-ton crane, and it's just a large assembly area where many large experiments have been constructed. I'll show you two experiments that I've worked on where we used, um, we took advantage of that large area and the crane to do some of the construction of our experiment. And these two areas are lab spaces and offices. Uh, all the engineering offices are under that roof. And here's, 
back to the bubble chamber. So during that fixed target era, the bubble chamber was underground and it looked like it looks on the left. Here's, here's the bubble chamber. Now um, is a very modern experiment called ADMX, the Axion Dark Matter Experiment. And that same area is just perfect for, for doing this experiment, which you'll hear a little bit about later, but I won't be talking too much about ADMX today. So, so I said, now something else is there. So therefore, we, the bubble chamber has been removed. And in 2004, it was decided it was a shame to keep it underground because it's such a cool detector and also the space could be used for something else. So it was raised and it was moved from its original location to the courtyard at SIDA. And this is what SIDA looks like today with the bubble chamber in the courtyard, the large geodesic dome behind it, and my office is right over to the right of the bubble chamber. And it is so cool just to look out and see the bubble chamber every day. I love that. So a little history of Fermilab. So the bubble chamber era was from, era was from about 1969 to 1988. And then when silicon detector performance greatly exceeded that of the bubble chamber. The bubble chamber fell out of favor. And that's when SIDET was born. And SIDET became a premier facility for um, packaging, testing, wire bonding, assembling silicon detectors for many applications, initially high energy physics detectors, but also then imagers as CCDs, dark matter detectors, CCDs, and other silicon based detectors and more. And now uh, we work on a lot of superconducting detectors. So I seriously think we should change our name from SIDET to SUDET or Psi SUDET or something like that to give, give some honor to the superconducting detectors. Uh, so the South Pole Telescope camera that I've worked on is comprised of superconducting antennas. Um, MKIDs, uh, microwave kinetic induction detectors, are used as both dark, dark matter detectors and as imagers, and we work on a lot of them at SIDET. Those are superconducting resonators. A lot of quantum sensors as superconducting resonators are developed at SIDET, and, and more. So to go back to the, the high energy physics detectors, which were kind of the start of, the, of SIDET, um, so about the same time that the bubble chamber fell out of favor and, and silicon-based detectors took over in high energy physics, um, that we also wanted to do higher energy physics than you could do with a fixed target beam. Because here you get the energy of, <clears throat> excuse me, of the accelerator, whatever energy the accelerator could deliver, and then it hits a stationary target. But if you could, accelerate particles in one direction and an antiparticle in the opposite direction, have them collide, you get twice the energy of the interaction. So kind of twice your bang for your buck. So, so that's when the colliding beam era started and there were not as there wasn't as much emphasis on fixed target beams. There are still a couple of fixed target beams, but but not like in the early days. So cite it. Um, was used a lot to build detectors that comprise D0, which was one of the colliding beam detectors, and CDF, the Collider Detector Facility, which was the other large colliding beam detector. So here are some pictures of those older experiments, CDF and D0 at Fermilab, which are no longer operating. Now the premier colliding beam facility in the world is CMS at CERN. But much of, of CIDAT's activities are to build detectors for CERN. So a lot of the a lot of a lot of CMS's instrumentation and silicon detectors are fabricated at CIDAT. This is and these are some examples of what the detectors look like that we work on at SIDET for these, these large detectors. Here for the detector at CERN, we work on the 
CMS is the detector's name, um, the compact muon solenoid forward detector. And these are the older detectors for the colliding detector facility. Here's the vertex detector, which was packaged and tested at Cite it and for D0, the forward detector, and more. This is just, uh, these are just a few examples of the detectors we work on for these high energy physics detectors. From all of this work, Cite it has many, has many assets that were developed over the years. For example, very highly skilled technicians, precision metrology, shown shown here, and, and wire bonding. Lots and lots of wire bonding goes on at Cite It. Um, so you really need super, you really need skilled technicians to operate the wire bonders and state-of-the-art machines to do the wire bonding. We also need clean rooms because we, we need to keep all of these silicon detectors very clean. Um, all of the detectors you want to be clean, but if they're used for imaging, you especially want them to be clean because so you don't want to image dust particles. So we have class 10,000 and class 100 clean rooms where the number reflects the number of particles per volume. So the people you see in these pictures are in class 10,000 clean rooms, which I can tell because of the way they're, they're dressed. They have hair nets on and smocks and booties, but they don't have complete jumpsuits like you see on the right, which you would need for the class 100 clean room. The class 100 clean room is reserved for uh, work where you need to be super, super clean. For example, the dark energy camera, which um, we probably are all familiar with, and I will show you um, some photos of it and a little history of, of the construction of it at CIDA. That's where we assembled the dark energy camera, because you really want those CCD imagers to be very, very, very clean. And an extremely important part of all of our workspaces is to maintain electrostatic discharge safety, because every year our sensors get more and more and more sensitive to electrostatic damage. So we um, make sure that we're using proper grounding techniques, um, have wrist straps and wrist strap monitors that tell you if you've become ungrounded. Ionizers, which is pictured here, which emit positive and negative charges to blow over your workspace to neutralize any charge on insulators, which you can't, you can't get rid of a charge on an insulator by grounding, but you can by neutralizing the charge with an ionizer. Um, we have humidity control in all of the clean rooms because it's harder to generate a spark if it's humid because when things are coated um, with moisture, the charges can more easily um, go to ground. And we wear special garments that you can't build up a static charge on. So in some ways, static is fun. Like this, this girl looks like I look in the winter here in the Midwest where my hair just stands up if I put on a wool sweater. So it's fun and it's funny, except for when you want to use some really sensitive detectors to do some cool physics, and then it's not fun anymore. So we're always really, really religious about, about adhering to all BSD safety rules. Here's a picture of me working on a cryostat and you can see I have, have my wrist strap on and it's so I'm grounded. So site it's involved in, in many, many projects. I mentioned the high energy physics projects, but there are also many astrophysics detectors and now more and more quantum sensor development and more. So I can't talk about all of them tonight. So I decided to concentrate on some of the detectors used for astrophysics. So I'm gonna show you a little tour. This will be a tour within a tour of Fermilab's Cosmic Physics Center to give you an overview of the key projects that, that Fermilab's Cosmic Physics Center is involved in. And many, most of the sensors shown in this four minute tour were packaged and tested at CIDET. For example, the dark energy camera, the dark energy spectroscopic instrument, DESI, Sensei CCDs, and the South Pole Telescope. So let's now take a tour of the Cosmic Physics Center.
Hello, here I am working in the lab on a microwave electronics circuit. As an engineering physicist at Fermilab, I'm thankful and thrilled to have the opportunity to work both in the lab and in the field on cosmic physics projects. In addition, I often have the opportunity to share my enthusiasm with visitors. Here I am with two colleagues waiting for a tour group to arrive. Today, you are my tour group, and I'd like to tell you about the Fermilab Cosmic Physics Center. Cosmic physics is the study of the laws and contents of the universe. We use the distribution of matter and light throughout space as a gigantic laboratory. First, I'd like to introduce you to two projects that study the mysterious dark energy that is accelerating the expansion of the universe. The dark energy camera on Cerro Tololo in Chile, and the dark energy spectroscopic instrument on Kitt Peak in Arizona. The sensors are the eyes of the telescope. The dark energy camera sensors were designed and fabricated by Lawrence Berkeley National Lab and then assembled, tested, and commissioned at Fermilab by people from across the international collaboration. The camera is comprised of 74 optical sensors. The camera creates digital images of distant galaxies that probe nearly halfway back to the Big Bang. Cerro Tololo is a great place for an optical telescope. The high elevation and proximity to the calm air mass rising over the Andes from the Pacific Ocean is essential to minimize atmospheric distortion, which can degrade image quality. The goal is to map hundreds of millions of galaxies and detect thousands of supernova to find patterns of cosmic structure that will reveal the nature of dark energy. The dark energy spectroscopic instrument on Kitt Peak will pinpoint location and velocity of 35 million galaxies by pointing an optical fiber at each galaxy. The high precision 3D map will give us new clues about dark energy. Strong evidence suggests invisible dark matter comprises most of the matter in the universe. Super CDMS, Sensei, and ADMX are searching for the identity of dark matter. Unlike telescopes that benefit from high altitudes, many dark matter experiments benefit from being deep underground, shielded from cosmic rays and other background radiation, in laboratories like Snow Lab in Sudbury, Ontario. In fact, Snow Lab is as far below sea level as the telescopes are above sea level. Super CDMS and Sensei will be located in a clean room deep underground in Snow Lab. Super CDMS sensors made of germanium and silicon are used to search for interactions of weakly interacting massive particles that may constitute the dark matter observed in the universe. Sensei scientists are using innovative sensors called skipper CCD to search for the lightest dark matter particles anyone has ever looked for. The skipper CCDs are also useful in the field of quantum optics. Using a large magnet, a microwave cavity, and ultra-sensitive, low-noise quantum electronics, ADMX is testing the theory that galactic dark matter halos could be made of particles called axions. Now, I'd like to introduce you to the South Pole Telescope. Light from the first moments after the Big Bang is still traveling across the universe. This light is called the cosmic microwave background and we've built a camera that is sensitive enough to detect it. The camera is comprised of 2,700 antennas searching for the faint microwave signals that can tell us about the physics behind Big Bang. We installed the camera on the telescope, which is just a short walk from the South Pole. This is me at the South Pole. The South Pole is a great place for a microwave telescope. Located 2,800 meters above sea level, it is very high and dry and cold. These conditions are optimal because water absorbs microwaves. At the South Pole, it is so cold that moisture in the atmosphere freezes out, providing an unobstructed path for the microwaves, which have been traveling for nearly 14 billion years to reach the telescope. The telescope continues to scan the cosmic microwave background 24-7. Thank you.
So, uh, so that might be a good place to pause if there are any questions. Uh, there's no questions. There's there's one comment uh, from Matt. He said that they're building a, a new bubble chamber in Lab B now. Ah, okay. Yep, there are new uses for bubble chambers. Um, so that that is true. There are other bubble chambers at Fermilab. <laughs> cool. Yeah, and Lab B is at SIDAT. <laughs> Thank you. All right, that's all we have for right now. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Matt. <laughs> um, so to zoom in even more, because there are so many astrophysics detectors being developed at Fermilab, I thought I'd choose um, to speak a bit about what we do at SIDAT regarding CCD-based detectors and what we do at, have done at SIDAT with respect to the construction of the camera for the South Pole Telescope. So first, CCD-based detectors. So at SIDA, we would um, do the following. To build the dark energy camera, we received um, the, the CCDs, the chips, bare chips from Lawrence Berkeley National Lab. And then at SIDA, we would glue them, as shown in the second picture, glue them to a circuit board, put them on an in-bar foot, and then test them in a cryostat. The CCDs are operated at around liquid nitrogen temperatures. And we would test them like crazy. We would test them, um, measure the quantum efficiency at many different wavelengths. We would measure linearity to see if we shine twice as much light on them. Do we get twice the signal out or something else? We carefully measure how many bad pixels there are, whether um, there's any crosstalk, and we we would then grade them and choose the 74 best CCDs to put on the focal plane for the dark energy camera. So we got to know these devices really, really, really well. So you can see on the right, the focal plane is partially populated, and here it's completely populated. So as I mentioned, all of the devices we work on at site practically are very sensitive to ESD damage, but um, the, the CCDs are especially sensitive. Uh, so any semiconductor device can be damaged by a spark, but MOS devices, metal oxide semiconductor devices, are particularly susceptible. So a CCD is an array of millions of these little MOS capacitors. So they're super sensitive to ESD damage. So SIDET's care in preventing ES damage was essential to making this camera work. So once we built the camera at SIDET, we did not send it right away to Chile. First, we decided that we would test it in a telescope simulator. So what is a telescope simulator? It's, it's a replica of the Blanco telescope's inner and outer rings and the fins or the spider um, that connect the camera to the rings. So here's a simulator, a drawing on the left. You'll see the real thing in a minute. And so we're simulating this part. So this part up here of the telescope, the Blanco telescope, and here's another view of it. And the simulator, so why are we doing that? Um, so that we could tilt and rotate the camera just like it would move on the telescope in Chile. So we wanted to be sure the CCDs didn't move or shift. We wanted to make sure the nitrogen cooling lines um, didn't get tangled or that, that the nitrogen would still be flowing, for example. Um, so, um, and we also wanted experience assembling the camera into to those outer rings. And where did we build the simulator? We built it under that geodesic dome that I mentioned with 20 ton crane. So the usefulness of doing this was it allowed us to verify the operation of the camera and all the orientations it would be in before shipping the camera to Chile. It's much easier to fix things at home than it is, is on the mountaintop in Chile. So 
It also served to develop procedures and to practice assembling before you had the camera in Chile. So let's do a time-lapse video of the construction of the telescope simulator at SIDET. So this video is, um, everything you see is under that geodesic dome and here and there you'll see that giant 20 ton crane. John, we have uh, we got two questions, uh, if you don't mind, before you move on. Mm -hmm. Sounds good. Uh, Dave asks, when the geodesic dome was installed, like how long has that been at Fermi? Oh, um, I don't know. Um, but I think it was very early. Like SIDET was built, kind of a lot of the buildings around SIDET were built after that. Um, so I think it was there in the 70s, but I don't know. I'm sorry. Okay. And then uh, 
Eric asks, um, why are the sensors in the South Pole Telescope different shades of blue? Like, I think you've shown that camera a couple times and the, all the sensors are always oh. at a different shades of blue. Yeah, it, it's not the South Pole Telescope, that's the dark energy camera, but um, yeah, let's go back. Yeah, that's, that's because of non-uniformities in the anti-reflective coating, and that's not a good thing. Um, that's not what we wanted, but we can calibrate that out. But yeah, yeah. So I, ideally, that would be a uniform. Yes, absolutely. <laughs> yeah. So it was. It's extra work. It ended up being extra work, you know, for for calibrating. But it's still fine. Um, yes. Good question. We weren't trying, it's not cool that it looks like modern art. <laughs> okay, that's all we have for right now. Okay, thanks. So, okay, so once we were happy with the performance of the camera, it was time for a road trip. So it was decided, first we had to decide whether to, to take all of the CCDs out and ship each one separately and then reassemble it all in Chile or to put all our eggs in one basket, keep them all installed as they were on the telescope simulator and carefully transport it to Chile. And we went with a second one, putting all our eggs in one basket. And DCAM went to Miami by truck, then to Santiago, Santiago by air, and then by truck to the mountain, and then was driven up to the observatory. Um, the camera, sat on a suspension system to cushion the ride designed by NAA member Greg Derlow. I don't know if he's watching tonight or not, but um, so this is a picture of Greg installing these um, shock absorbers and he tested a box with a mock-up weight for the camera extensively at a lab in Michigan beforehand to be, to be really sure that this was gonna protect give enough shock absorbing protection to our beloved camera. And it, and it made it. Thank you, Greg. And here is DCAM installed on the Blanco telescope today as it's been observing for a long time. And again, here's a good picture to show what the telescope simulator was simulating here. And here's a, I like this picture because it shows a very relaxed astronomer admiring the telescope. So back to the devices themselves, um, the, the CCDs um, can be used as particle detectors or as light detectors. So in the camera, they're used to detect light, but charge can be created by a passing photon or particle. So they're good for particle detectors. And the CCDs um, got their name from the way the charge or the signal is transferred from each pixel to the readout register where the charge is measured and digitized. Um, as, oops, as I mentioned, we, we tested these CCDs like crazy. And we also ended up having twice as many science grade CCDs, um, tw twice as many as we needed, which is unusual. <laughs> and wonderful. So it was realized that these CCDs would be great for many other experiments that, that were detecting both light or particles. So now these CCDs are deployed all around the world in many different experiments. And the last time I talked to, to everyone at NAA, that's what I talked about. I talked about all of these different experiments that use that use or that use these DCAM CCDs or cousins of the DCAM CCDs. So I won't really talk too much about this, but I just like to like to point out that you know the dark energy cameras in Chile, but um, there's also an experiment that uses the same CCDs as a particle detector, as a dark matter detector, in Snow Lab in in Ontario, and then there's a detector outside a nuclear power plant in Brazil, trying to detect coherent neutrino nucle nucleus interactions where the reactor is providing the neutrinos. Um, there's 
the, the rather skipper CCDs that are uh, were in the Minos lab tunnel at Fermilab for preliminary tests, but is now being deployed in Snow Lab where Damic is in Sudbury, Ontario. There's the dark energy spectroscopic instrument, which saw first light um, mid last year that's on Kitt Peak in Arizona. And we hope to have a dark matter experiment in space on a CubeSat. So um, I think I'm proud of, proud of those CCDs that were, again, the CCDs themselves are were designed and fabricated by Lawrence Berkeley National Lab. Um, I guess now would be, I'm gonna to switch to the South Pole telescope camera. So now might be a good time to ask for questions. We don't have any more questions right now. Okay, okay, hold on, okay. So SPT3G is the third generation camera for the South Pole telescope. So what is meant by camera? That term always seems, seems vague to me. So in this case, um, the camera is comprised of new optics and a new optics cryostat, which is the lens. So here's the lens on a traditional camera and here's the lens on SPT3G. And the receiver cryostat is the body of the camera. So in that case, it's this rectangular chamber behind the lenses. And the film in this case is the array of superconducting microwave antennas. So the initial testing of the cryostats and the optics was done at Fermilab where we assembled it all under the geodesic dome and tested to Fermilab before shipping to the South Pole. So I have to admit it broke my heart because to work on this project under the geodesic dome, it was decided to disassemble the telescope simulator. And I just, I just came, became very attached to that telescope simulator, but it is no longer under the geodesic dome. And um, the next project we worked on there was the South Pole telescope. And some of the details of the, the cryostat might be of, of the, of the, of the whole optics and receiver cryostat that might be of interest to, to you is that, um, so there are, there's, there are several lenses, they're um, microwave lenses, so they're made out of alumina. And there are actually, um, the receiver cryostat is called a cryostat because we want the lenses to be at four Kelvin so that they, they're not radiating. So, um, we have an outer shell that's room temperature and then a 50 Kelvin shell and then a four Kelvin shell. And we use a, a refrigerator that is connected to the optics cryostat and those, those two cold stages, 50K and 4K that's mounted here. It's called a pulse tube cooler. So it has two stages. The detectors themselves are superconducting and they're operated at sub-Kelvin temperatures, so at 250 millikelvin. So there we have several, we have the 50 Kelvin shell, 4 Kelvin, and then another refrigerator that's called a helium sorption refrigerator that cools from that 4 Kelvin stage down to 250 millikelvin. So to, uh, so to assemble the optics cryostat, it's kind of like putting a Russian doll together with the different layers. So here's a little stop motion video of the assembly of the optics cryostat. And again, this is still at Fermilab under the geostat symptom. Back here is the, the receiver cryostat. And here's the refrigerator I was talking about. Okay, and here, now that it's assembled, it was those, the two cryostats were put together, the optics and the receiver cryostat. Um, this shows the, 
objects cryostat removed just so you could see where where the 10 uh, detector wafers would go. Uh, here you see the, the detector array in place. We'll look at that a little more closely. So after we confirmed that the receiver and optics cryostats are functioning well, they were disassembled and shipped to the South Pole via New Zealand. And most cargo and people fly to the South Pole from New Zealand on these cool C-130 aircraft. So we'll go from New Zealand to McMurdo, McMurdo to the South Pole, and then it arrived at the South Pole, and then the two cryostats were assembled. But what about, that's the cryostats, and <laughs> so what about the film? So the film are the, the superinducting microwave antennas, and those are fabricated at the Center for Nanoscale Materials at Argonne National Lab. So Fermilab has no nanofabrication capabilities. So like we got the dark energy CCDs from Lawrence Berkeley Lab, and we got the superconducting antennas for the South Pole Telescope from Argonne National Lab, and similarly for, for many other projects. So we don't actually do semiconductor fabrication at Fermilab. So, so we we get these from Argonne, which is just about 30 miles from Fermilab. Sometimes I just drive over there and pick them up. And here's just a close-up of these wafers and what one pixel looks like, which I've talked about before. So maybe I won't talk too much about that right now. And this is what we do at SIDA. <laughs> so we assemble these these detectors. And so you have to assemble this exploded view. So on the bottom layer is the wafer itself. And then we put an array of lenslets on top of it, which uh, each, there's a lenslet for each pixel. And then you clamp it all together very carefully. And uh, here's a little more detail about how you, what you really do in the lab. This was part of my job. This was my job. And so I would inspect the wafer under a microscope. I would put that lenslet array on top. And then I would need to align those two to make sure the lenslets really were right on top of each pixel by aligning fiducials on each of the six corners of a hex wafer using an infrared microscope. So you, here's the what I'm looking at to move the lenslet array um, gently to make these fiducials align with that to tattoo mark that's on the wafer. So one pattern's on the wafer and one's on the lenslet array. And then once it's all aligned, then I would very carefully clamp everything together. And then you, you we would um, glue cables to the perimeter, all of the inputs and outputs around the perimeter of the wafer. We, wire bond using these state-of-the-art Hess wire bonders. This is a close-up of the wire bond heads. And then um, you'd attach the, the readout electronics. These are frequency multiplex. So inside here are some chips that have these uh, bunch of resonators to create our frequencies for the frequency multiplexing. And these are those cables that you saw uh, streaming out from the wafer here. The cables get connected to these boards very carefully. And then these cables, once it's installed in the, in the cryostat, will um, provide the input and output to from warm to cold. And then it's ready for testing either at SIDET. We had capability to test these wafers at SIDET, but we couldn't test all of them. We, um, many of our collaborators also were set up for testing. So sometimes I would ship them to collaborators for testing. And when we had our, the best 10 wafers, um, they were put in sturdy boxes that we call Pelican boxes. And they were hand carried on the plane to the South Pole when we all went to the South Pole to put this all together. 
So after the detectors and people are at the South Pole, it's time to assemble the detector array and install it in the cryostat. So while this talk is about CIDET, people from CIDET, like me, went with the detector to the South Pole to, to kind of repeat what we did at CIDET to, to build, build up the array again. So here's the commute to work at the South Pole. Walking from where you live, you get closer and closer to the telescope. And this shows the South Pole telescope and the BICEP telescope. And these are like two floors that's comprised of laboratory space. There's a little clean room that you can assemble the detectors in. And this is the outhouse. And uh, this is a corridor that connects the laboratory to the uh, lab space underneath the telescope. So notice that the telescope is, is leaned over here, like touching the top of the building. If it is, gets tilted, if you tilt it back, oops, if you tilt it back, you can see that there are doors under here. This is where the whole receiver, everything I've been showing you, the optics cryostat and the receiver cryostat lives today when it's observing the cosmic microwave background. So when you want to install all of that in here, you lower the telescope and these doors, there's, it mates with um, doors in the ceiling of this room where the cryostat was before we installed it. You open those doors, you slide those doors open, you open these doors, move this down, and now they're mated and you can then move the receiver cryostat up into the receiver cabin and then close all those doors and then tilt it back up again and it's ready to do observing. This is just another view to show, to show that the telescope is kind of mated to this building. It's in what we call the docked position. And in this position, the optics and receiver cryostats can be installed into the receiver cabin from inside this laboratory space. So I'm gonna conclude with a video that shows, a time-lapse video that shows us installing all of those, those wafers, with all those cables into the receiver, into the array here, then we moved it into this area and installed it into the receiver cryostat. So that's what this concluding video will show. It'll take me a second to start this, I'm afraid.
Up lyrics, let's maybe to say now that um, South Pole Telescope is Kai's dad and, and camera is at the South Pole, we might wonder well, now what's under the geodesic dome? Yes, under there now are some test cryostats where we're testing um, components that would be part of CMB S4, like the CMB experiment of the future. So we're um, working on that as well. On different, a little bit similar, but a little bit different. So there's a lot of work going on for us as well. That's all I have. All right, we have several questions that have come in. Um, so one of them, uh, I, I think I saw you on several of the pictures, you were down there in the South Pole during that assembly, correct? Okay. And then uh, uh, one of our members, Kurt, chimed in and, and found an article about the creation of the geodesic dome. It, it turns out it was finished in 1972. It started in uh, 1970, but was finished in 1972. Oh. Mm, so it was early, early, early days. Of that. Um, I guess I should have known, partly should have known it was designed by Robert Wilson, the first director of the lab. Yeah, the article actually said he he purposely was trying to find a creative roof for it. <laughs> so that's kind of where that came about. Um, oh, pardon my interrupting, but uh, Donna has kind of dropped out on my end voice-wise uh, since she showed the last video, I could barely hear her. So I don't know if anybody else is having that issue. Or did, maybe did I just get quiet? Yes, you did from my uh, end in <laughs> of the uh, screen here. Now? Oh, even now as I'm speaking a little louder? So. It's a lot quieter than you were a minute ago. Uh, Jim was still loud. But... Hmm. I, I'm hearing her, hearing her at, a, at a good volume. Oh, curious. I mean, maybe Donna talks kind of quiet anyway, but I... Well, it's, you know, she's just much quieter than she was um, before that last video play. So. Um, okay, so speak up, Donna. <laughs> Maybe it's uh, because from all that music, our ears, you know, <laughs> all the rock music, and then after hearing that song at the end, it just screwed up our ears. <laughs> just kidding. Uh, so uh, Eric asks, and I think this is going back to the dark energy camera, he said, other than the size, 
how are your sensors different than uh, ones in regular cameras? Um, wow. Um, well, that, oh, wow. Um, That's too complicated of a... Yeah, yeah, although, you know, it's, it's operated very differently in that um, they're, they're not color sensors. You know, you have to use filters to get any color and redshift information. Um, so each, you know, each pixel is, is really just one pixel. It's not divided up and they're operated cold so that the noise is really low. And um, so in that sense, the dark energy camera sensors, you know, aren't that different in that sense. Um, I might add, though, that the newer sensors, like the Skipper CCDs that I mentioned, are being used for the say dark matter experiment, and also now for quantum optics. Those are very different, even though the overall array is the same. The way they're read out is very different, and that you can read out the charge in a pixel multiple times, uh, even more than multiple, hundreds, thousands of times to greatly reduce the noise. Because if you can sample something over and over and over again, and it's exactly the same thing you're sampling, you can really increase the signal to noise. So what's uh, hard to do in that design that Berkeley was able to do was to measure the charge, then move it back to the readout register without losing any charge to resample it. So those CCDs are very different, but um, I'm not doing a good job at answering what's how the DCAM CCDs are real, really different. Um, I assume the cost is, is a lot more. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, I don't think I know how very well how to answer that. I mean, we have 15 micron pixels and, you know, so, yeah, the size is different, but sorry about that. Yeah, I think you did that. Okay, we have a few more. Um, oh, so Steve just asks, does each pixel give an RGB value? Um, no, um, each pixel just gives one value and we observe the sky through five different filters. So first you observe the sky with um, one, like a, the filters cover the entire array. So they're huge filters. So you remotely, you know, like you and there's a filter bank up on the telescope that's always there, and you slide in one filter, observe the sky, then take it up and then put in the next bandpass filter, and the next one, and the next one. So that's how you get the, the color, or in the end, you know, the like um, color information, and also you can get a redshift from that, a photometric redshift. It's not as good as a spectroscopic one, but you can definitely get a redshift from that, and then also just the color. Does that make sense? So there are no filters on the on the CCDs yeah. at all. Sounds like a giant filter wheel. Um, yeah, it, it kind of is. It's not in a wheel shape, but yeah, it's like a giant filter wheel, exactly. Mm -hmm. uh, and then Steve asks, what is the bit depth? Oh, I don't know. I don't even know what that means. Bit depth, what is bit depth? All right, well. We'll see if Steve chimes back in. Maybe you can come back to it. Um, uh, Chris asks, uh, who is responsible for the design of the South Pole um, camera? Who, who created that? Was that a big collaboration or did, was any oh. anyone specific uh, credited for creating that? Well, I should get back to you on the exact answer for that, but um, it did evolve from another, another telescope called Polar Bear has a similar design. And um, a lot of the people on the Polar Bears, it's also a cosmic microwave background experiment. Um, 
uh, work on the South Pole Telescope. So I think it originated with the Polar Bear Telescope design, but then you could say, where did that one come from? Um, I'm not really sure where the origin is. Okay. So I don't know how I can get back to you, but I should get back to you on really what the origin is. And the origin of the, the cool sinuous antenna that's in the center of each pixel is, is a, a modernized but old design from um, like radar astronomy to have a wide bandwidth antenna. So it's sort of sort of fractal like so that it's it's wide band. Um, but I don't know the original the very beginning of it. So it's yeah and it's both bolometer based. Um, but hmm I have to find that out. <laughs> Um, one comment was uh, it, everything in the U.S. is assembled in clean rooms and then in Antarctica it looked like everyone was wearing normal clothes. Is there any concern of contamination of stuff during the installation? Yeah, um, not a lot. When, when we actually, um, you know, put, put the wafers together and put um, the electronics, those tall boards and stuff on the back, like a lot of the work on, it, and if we ever opened a detector where um, the, the wafer was, ex, was exposed, we did that in a clean room at the South Pole. But where you saw us putting it all together, it was, um, it was, the sensitive parts were kind of are kind of protected just by the geometry of the detectors. So 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 not real yeah, so it was okay that we weren't in a clean room doing what we were doing. But steps before putting it putting them all together were done um, upstairs from where you saw us putting the big array together. Um, that was done in a clean room at the South Pole. Okay, and then uh, uh, Drew Drew asked uh, how cold was that uh, room that you were assembling it in? We could some people had you know coats on or seemed yeah. to be just a little more warm, and some were were uh, just in looked like lighter sweaters. How, how cold was that room? It it was it was not cold. It was probably maybe 60 degrees, depends on whether we had that, that uh, like the door open overhead that would mate with the telescope receiver cabin. Sometimes air would blow in from there. So depended on what we had open, but it was never real cold um, with the work that I had to do at the South Pole. I was, when you're indoors, you're plenty warm. Yeah. And then uh, a few more, uh, so what they were saying about the bit depth, uh, they said, is it like 16 bit or 64 bit? So I think after the, the data is captured, how, how, do you know how? Uh, I don't know the answer to that. Okay. Yeah. Um, Ed asked about how many hours a year does the telescope operate? I assume he's talking about the South Pole Telescope. But maybe you can answer for both telescopes. Yeah, the South Pole Telescope operates almost 24 seven, um, but the data is kind of better in the winter than in the summer, just because it's, it, can, it can be cloudier in the summer. In the summer, it's light, the sun's not down ever, you know, the sun's up all the time in the summer. So it's not quite as good. In fact, I'm personally just starting to do some analysis to find out how the summer, how good the summer fields are, good or bad. But, but we do operate 24 seven all year round, except for if we had to um, go down in the summer and replace some of the 
array, which we, we did do after the first year. So then you're not operating during the, and the summer is the only time you can go to the South Pole. You can only, planes can only land there like from um, October through the beginning of February. So that's when people would go and um, work on the, on, their, on the telescope. But last year we didn't change anything so it could operate all the time. Um, although we paused, we paused for several weeks, um, some years, and will this year for the Event Horizon Telescope. So the Event Horizon Telescope uses the South Pole Telescope and as one of the, the several telescopes that comprise the interferometer for the Event Horizon Telescope. So we can't we can observe simultaneously because their receivers um, block our, our receiver. So, um, so that's some time that we don't observe, but that's for a very good cause and a very good cause. <laughs> how, did, uh, how did COVID affect the work last year? Can <laughs> um, it, it affected it a lot in the sense that um, no extra people went to the South Pole. Like if we couldn't have done what you saw in that video. So they didn't allow anybody except for two people to go and relieve the two people who had been wintering over for the South Pole telescope. And similarly for the other projects at the South Pole. So the, the bare minimum number of people were allowed to fly into the South Pole. So, um, yeah, so, so, however, our experiment right now doesn't need any upgrading. So um, we didn't really lose anything because of COVID. So we were fortunate, but if it had been two years ago, it would have been very unfortunate. So I'm sure some of the experiments at the South Pole are suffering a lot from that limitation. Yeah. And it takes forever. Well, and it takes forever for um, to get to the South Pole now because of all the quarantining along the way. So one, uh, I think this might be our last question. Uh, when when you were aligning those sensors, uh, how was the array? configured? Is it X by Y pixels? Is it, uh, is it a... Um, is it a certain number of pixels that you have to move things over by or, or I mean, you're looking at it under an electron microscope to... to oh, how... no, that, that's, um, yeah, I, it wasn't really an electron microscope. It was just an optical telescope, but made, but, um, I was actually using the infrared light so that it would get through this because I had to see through a, a thick silicon wafer that the, the superconduct, the niobium circuitry and the antennas were on. So no, I, it was kind of a macroscopic alignment and I did that by hand, literally, you know, taking a, a tool and like just pushing it or very gently. So it was done manually. It's pretty tedious, but not not as it would never have been a pixel off. But um, but you you want it you want the you want the light to be focused on the antenna because in the area surrounding the antenna are the bolometers, and you don't want the light to hit the bolometers without having gone through the antenna and all the filtering. So it's important that they're aligned. But the each pixel is big because it's it's a microwave telescope, so each pixel is a couple millimeters in diameter, so it's big. So it's not like CCD small pixels. I don't know if that answered it. Probably be easier if I showed the picture. I think I think you answered it okay. Yeah. Uh, okay, I don't think we have any more questions. If I missed anybody, I apologize. Um, usually. 
somebody emails a question three minutes after we we hang up. Uh, <laughs> but uh, those are all the questions I see right now. So thank you very much. Uh, I'm going to flip it back over to Drew. Drew, are you there? I am here. <laughs> Just uh, getting back to, uh, let's see, I guess that's a blank screen up there. <laughs> well, thank you very much, Donna. Um, that was a very interesting talk. And uh, I remember touring Fermilab in what must have been like 1976 or something or other. And yeah, that building was there and the the geodesic dome was made out of pop cans at that time, but uh, I think they've replaced that since then. <laughs> so uh, it was actually beer cans and pop cans in between two layers of Lexan. Anyway, um, to return to the uh, Astronomy Club meeting, let's see. Um, before we do our business uh, portion, uh, we have a little uh, recognition to give to one of our, our members here. And uh, so, um, the Astronomical League is a national and actually you now somewhat international federation of astronomy clubs and individual, mostly amateur astronomers. And uh, the league sponsors a number of different observing programs, quite a large number now of different observing programs, which encourage uh, stargazers, amateurs to get out and uh, view and study the heavens and many of the different objects in the heavens. And one of our members, Ron, has uh, earned actually a number of their certificates in the past, and he has now completed uh, their double star program, which entails, involves uh, using their list of target objects and double stars in this case, and actually going out observing them and then making uh, uh, records. Uh, of the observations that he makes, uh, filling in a number of uh, different answers about each object to uh, show that he has actually studied them and has learned something from them. So uh, Ron has completed that program. He's gotten a certificate. And Ron has uh, sent us a little bit, a little short video on the program. And so I'm going to share that with you, if I can. Um, you share. There we go. Well, hello, everyone. I'm Ron Zess, and today I want to talk briefly about the Astronomical League's Double Star Program. This is something that I really enjoyed participating in. When you sign up for this, you get a list of 100 objects that you get to observe as you progress through all the seasons. And when you complete the list, uh, as I did through the course of last year, and you submit your observations, then the league sends you a certificate like this in recognition of the work that you did. But not only that, uh, you get to see uh, some beautiful objects, a uh, hundred of the brightest and best double stars that the Northern Hemisphere has to offer. Now, some of them you are no doubt familiar with, like uh, the double-double in Lyra, or the trapezium uh, in the Orion Nebula. But there were also many others that uh, a novice like myself at the time uh, really appreciated being introduced to. And uh, I was really glad to uh, learn of and find uh, a lot of other nice objects to look at. So another thing that I really appreciated about this program is just how accessible these objects are, uh, much more so than uh, other objects that I had to track down in other pro programs that I had participated in with the Astronomical League in the past, uh, to find some of the faint fuzzies of uh, earlier programs. I would often find myself having to travel way out of my way sometimes even out of state, just to get the skies that uh, would allow me to see the objects in the first place. But double stars are point sources, and they punch through light pollution, and they overcome uh, a lot of the 
very adverse conditions that we often find ourselves surrounded by. And so here I had a program where I could just step out right into my own backyard, start observing, and not have to worry about whether or not I had the, the perfect night. So that was something that uh, I really appreciated. Another thing is that uh, they are really beautiful objects. Uh, one that comes to mind uh, that I particularly enjoyed was uh, the double star Almach that you find uh, just above the constellation Triangulum. And this was a star, that, a pair of stars that had striking colors of blue and red. And it also uh, reminded me that the uh, colors in stars was something that I had tended to overlook before. And so I really appreciated the program kind of getting me to focus and, and see more through the eyepiece uh, that I might have overlooked before, just the beauty of colors that stars can have. Uh, others would be a fun challenge that would test uh, the optics and your observing skills. Uh, Izar is one that comes to mind. Uh, so you find the object and you, know, you really have to uh, work at it to get this bright star in your eyepiece. And I remember just what a satisfying moment it was when it would resolve into two distinct uh, objects side by side. And so uh, you could have a kind of fun challenge with this too. Because uh, it's not always easy to, to split some of them. So um, this is a program that really was a, a lot of fun, uh, both in the beauty of the objects or uh, a challenge if you uh, pick some of the, the closer doubles. Uh, it's something I would definitely recommend uh, to try, even if you don't complete the whole program. Uh, if you just have a free night and you want to get out. Uh, it's a great way to spend a, a little time uh, observing and uh, seeing things that are uh, accessible. Anyway, clear skies. Again, congratulations to Ron and uh, uh, bravo for his dedication to cataloging the universe the way he is as an uh, observer. If you uh, are not familiar with the Astronomical League. Well, the NAA is a member society. We have been a long time. So you can look up the league on uh, the web and they have a lot of information about the, their observing programs. And if you're interested in any of them, uh, you can join the league as a uh, member at large, but you get a considerable savings. If you join as a member of the, of the NAA, uh, it's 750 a year, I believe. So. Uh, when it comes to dues renewal time, that's something you can add into your dues. That pretty much wraps things up for us. Uh, members out there, you can, uh, in a couple of minutes, when we ended this meeting, you can uh, move over to a Zoom yourself and join in for our uh, socializing, our post-meeting socializing. Um, I would re repeat, since especially since this is going to end up uh, being on YouTube in a week or so uh, in our uh, library of presentations there. If you are watching us on YouTube now, uh, somewhere down the road, uh, do take a minute and, you know, press those buttons that uh, subscribe you so you will uh, see our future presentations in your YouTube feed. And uh, gets a little bit of a benefit for the club to just help spread the word that we've got those resources there. Otherwise, for tonight, uh, oh, did you have something, Jim? I said click that like button on the... Uh... Oh, there's a like button. OK. Um, yes, I should say um, click the like button <laughs> where it is down there. And, uh, and then the subscribe circle is going to come up over here somewhere. Um, actually, I guess it's over. Here somewhere, as I usually put it when we edit those in. Um, yes, click like, click subscribe, um, do all those things that you know you're supposed to do when you uh, enjoy somebody's product up here in the uh, on the internet. Anyway, otherwise for the evening, uh, big thank you again for joining us. We hope you are appreciating our our live presentations that we're doing this way.
and uh, keep on being inquisitive, uh, learning about space and uh, the universe out there, and looking up and enjoying the sky. So good night now. <laughs>